We are going to pick back up in uh, Second Corinthians uh, tonight. We're still in chapter one. Second Corinthians. Chapter one, picking up at verse eight. A little quick recap from last week. We dealt with the comforts in suffering. And we said a lot last week, but that the suffering of God uh, produces some things. Does anybody remember uh, what, what those things were? There were three things that this particular word said on last week uh, that suffering produced in the life of a believer. What were they? Perseverance. Perseverance. Character. 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 Hope. And hope. Amen. Do not forget those. And tonight we are going to transition out of the comfort to the exciting part, which is the deliverance. <laughs> Allison. <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> deliverance from suffering. And I love the fact that you and I both find that uh, humorous. It's good, amen, to be delivered <laughs> from that suffering. And I, I, I don't know if you've ever looked at Christ uh, this way, and I love the cross, so I'm going to draw it. But when you look at the life of Jesus Christ, we know him to be many things. But the thing we can never forget that he was is that he was a servant. But what type of servant? He was a suffering servant. All right. Let's never forget that Christ, we see it all throughout his public ministry. Yes, he served, but he suffered. And it took the power from God on high to do what? Deliver him, Deliver him also from his suffering. You see the parallel in that? Because remember we talked about on last week that that same suffering, we will also have or rejoice in that consolation. So understanding that there will come a period where we are being delivered from that suffering. Good news or bad news, here's the reality, is that sometimes that suffering, and this is biblical, and we're going to see a little bit of this tonight, but sometimes that deliverance doesn't come through anything else but what? Suffering. What did Jesus have to do to be delivered? Okay. And I've had, to, I've had to minister to people, literally, that were on their deathbed, and they were saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, undeniable. And we pray that the Lord's will be done, but yet their suffering, they were not officially delivered until the, the Lord God himself took their soul. All right, and we're going to see, we're going to go a little bit deeper in that tonight. Now, can the Lord do it before death? Absolutely. He's God. He is absolute God. He is absolute sovereign. He's in total control. Our power is in his hands. But again, what is the will of God? And now what we're going to see is the Apostle Paul on tonight uh, in the latter part of the, of the chapter is get into the deliverance. We're going to deal with Paul's sincerity and then sparing the church, sparing the governing body. This is very, very important. All right. Comments or questions before we go ahead and get into the verse in verse eight. Um, on tonight. OK, amen. Let's begin. Second Corinthians chapter one, verse eight. For we do not want you to be what? Ignorant. Underline that. Anytime you see the word ignorant, this is not the Apostle Paul poking his finger in the chest of you, calling you dumb and he's smarter than you, stumped the chump. I'm better than you. No, no. Paul is is bringing up a point that if we're not careful, we could slide into the way of ignorance dealing with this specific verse. All right, he says ignorant on a lot of different things, on a handful of them, and this is important. So to me, as a, as a studier, this is one of those things that has always grabbed my attention. So I wanna know what he's saying that I could lack knowledge in. And here's what he's saying for us not to be ignorant of. Brethren of our what? Of our troubles which came to us in Asia that we were burdened beyond measure. We were burdened above strength so that we even despaired or our lives were even in trouble. All right. What do you think in this particular verse 
that the Apostle Paul does not want the saints of the Most High God to be ignorant of. And remember what we're talking about tonight. Okay, for who? But for who? The saints. Okay. And Paul is saying, listen, I, I've and I'm, I'm going to speak on his behalf because I, I, I've, I really, really love his letters in the New Testament. But, you know, there's times and we're going to see we'll, we'll dive a little bit into Acts. We, we won't go too far in there. But I want to show you, you know, this is the same guy that laid over someone by the name of Eutychus. Remember that Bible study on the third floor, brother fell and died. Right. Paul lays over him prostrate by faith and calls on heaven. And now he's resurrected back to life. The same brother that was snake bitten by a very venomous snake. And the, and the bystanders are like, whoa, this guy's different. Why is he not dead? Everybody else has gotten bitten by the snake has died. This is the brother who has done some great exploits in the name of Jesus. And yet even he is not exempt from suffering, trials and tribulation. It is no different for you and I. Please don't be ignorant of that. Are you with me on tonight? All right. It, it's, it's a part of what we do, to, it, and, it's, and it's wrapped in the character of who we are in Christ. It's a part of it. All right. Then he goes on to say, look at verse nine. Is it yes, we even had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves. Do you see the front part of that verse? We had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves. Man, that's good. What's Paul saying? Let me finish the verse. We had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who does what? Raises the dead. Okay. What's going on here? There's one thing that the apostle Paul is eliminating here, and I want us to see it. What does it take to raise somebody from the dead? Faith, but it takes power. Power in who? Okay. Power in Jesus Christ. To raise somebody from the dead, it takes the dunamis. It takes the sure enough power of almighty God to raise the dead. Paul is saying, even though I am sold out for Christ, I find myself in trouble. My life was at stake. My life was in jeopardy. And you can go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 19. We're going to get there. We're going to hang out there for a little bit. Even though, listen, I, Paul is saying, we've done some crazy exploits in the name of the Lord. My life uh, was at stake. But what he's saying is, is in this time, it forced me not to trust in all of what I know, but it forced me to put my trust in who? The all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing Jesus Christ. So this is good news for us. So, so if you find yourself in trouble in your walk, find this as a blessing because it creates the opportunity, like Paul says, that even though my life is almost like it's up for death sentence, it's all good because I'm trusting that the Lord is going to use this, use this time for his glory. That the Lord is, see, this takes a different state of mind. This takes a different thinking. It takes on a totally different thinking. Think about it. Like nobody wants to be in trouble. Nobody's life wants to be put on the line. I get it. But if we're thinking differently, this is an opportunity for us to trust even deeper in who? Jesus Christ. It's beautiful. And I love this but because in the end, he says that not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. So right here, what Paul does is Paul kills the opportunity for a power struggle. Mark are running out on me. Paul does not, listen, he says, it's not my power. It, it, I can't do anything. And we're going to see this hopefully when we get to chapter 12. And uh, there we go. That's a lot better. But there is no power struggle here. And the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, Lord, I'm not I'm not even going to fight you. 
I'm giving it to you. And I'm knowing, because we talked about this on Sunday on the pulpit, the, the spiritual maturity, being able to differentiate right, between something that be, could be misconstrued as punishment, but is actually a holy provision from Almighty God. Right? This is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. All right, let's go to, let's see, let's go to, oh, I said 19. Let's go to 14. I'm sorry. Let's go to 14, 14, 19. I had it backwards. Somebody read that when you get it, please. Yep. And having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Yeah. You hear that? All right. So this brother was stoned. I mean, stoned. Like, probably not fun. <laughs> Just saying. Stoned. Thought he was dead. He lived because of the power of Jesus Christ. The Lord wasn't finished with him. And we see now the, the gravity of what it meant. Like he, he really lived a life commissioned to Christ. And yet it seems like the more he commissioned and committed his life to Christ, that the greater the troubles and the circumstances begin to grow in his life. Have you seen that? Is anybody, can anybody testify to that personally? Right. If you walk with the Lord long enough, trust me, it, it, it's like, man, but, and you look at, and if you look, you look at the trouble and you go, but Lord, I love you. <laughs> I trust you. I believe in you. I give to you. I give you my time. I talk with you every day. I study your written infallible word. I mean, and <laughs> And we start trying to balance the two. I got trouble on one side. I got you on the other. And if we're not careful, we'll pay more attention to the trouble instead of what Paul is doing. He's saying, listen, I understand it's not a power struggle. Lord, you can raise folks from the dead. I got to trust you. Amen. Amen. Depending on where you spend your time, is, you can make an idol out of what happened to you in the trouble also. Sure. Sure. Let's go to James chapter one. Now, we're going to look at the, the mind state or the state of mind. Let's go to, we'll start at verse two. We'll go up to, let's go to eight. All right. James chapter one. James chapter one, beginning at verse two. Listen what James says. My brother, my sister, count it what? When you do what? Okay, when you fall into various, meaning different kinds of. That's what the word various in the original, like it is different kinds of. All right, when you fall into different kinds of trials, knowing that the testing of your what? It produces what? Absolutely what we need. So James and the Apostle Paul are speaking the same language, even though they're two totally different men. But because they're connected to the same Christ and connected through some of the same experiences, they both can testify to what trouble, trial and tribulation can actually produce in the life of a believer. Amen. Amen. It's beautiful. Do you see that it can produce something? It can produce patience. It produces perseverance. But who in their right mind? would say, man, count this joy. <laughs> Have you ever thought of that? <laughs> like, I just got a diagnosis back from the doctor that told me I got about six months to live. God, and you want me to be thankful for that? God said, absolutely. Or at least, trust me in it now. <laughs> right? <laughs> Are you, like, you just, you just took somebody from me that I love. Like, you allow somebody, like, trust me. <laughs> I, I'm not happy with my job. I'm not happy with this. It doesn't matter. He said, trust me. So again, this takes, a di this takes on a different state of mind. This takes on a God mentality and a God conscious. This is, what this, this is what this does. Watch this. It says, but I let patience have its what? Perfect work. Means to complete, to run its course. Uh, you ever heard grandmama say that? Just let it run its course. Mama ever told you that? Let it run its course. So let patience run its course. I'm trying not to preach, but 
we, 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 we can't get to the end of this because we prematurely refuse to allow God's word and patience to run its course. We say, man, why hasn't I did what the word said, but did you let it run its course? Now watch this. Have its perfect work that you may be what? That means mature in the Greek to grow up. All right. To be made complete, to be made whole, uh, to mature. A lot of times. And I don't again, I don't want to be preachy. So please, the comments or whatever, say it, ask questions. But a lot of a lot of these troubles hit us because there's a maturing and a perfecting that Christ is attempting to do in us. We reject it and say, God, I don't like the way this feels. And God is like, I'm doing it to mature you. You don't like it, but I love you more than you like the trouble. Because if you can fall in love with me and let me have what do I do? do uh, help me, Lord. Do what I need to do. Then what I can do in your heart is transform and change and sanctify and kill some things in you that has been getting in the way. I like it. Then we need to stay there yeah. until that foundation is there. I like it. We miss something. I like it. And we talked about this again, even on Sunday, where we looked at Jonah's life, that discipline came in the form that led to what? Deliverance. Because for the Lord to continue to deliver us and not to provide discipline, again, we could get in the habit of thinking that, well, I can do whatever. I mean, deliverance is always going to be there. But discipline is important. Remember, we talked about that. Hebrews 12, 11. For no discipline and no chastening for the moment seems pleasurable or joyful, but rather painful. But later, the Bible says it produces or it, it produces what or yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness for those who allow train or to be trained by it. Are you with me tonight? All right. So discipline, trouble, chastening, it can also come in this form. Now, watch this. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him what? Who gives to all with what? Okay, freely. God's not going to get mad at you if you ask him for wisdom. All right, he's not. He wants you. He's not going to bend you over his knee and spiritually discipline you and spank you and put you in time out. No, he wants his children to ask of him to give them wisdom. Then he says, and without reproach, and it will be given to him, but let him ask how? Without doing what? Because doubt is like what? And for that man, it's supposed he won't receive anything from the Lord. Why? In verse 8, because what? He has two souls. I can't preach this Sunday, but Sunday, the, the one that I can't order the next one. I, mm, that's where we're going. He's got two souls. Psyche. He's got two souls. He's. He's he's basically or she's basically caught in between two minds. You got one on the other side whispering something, saying, do this, do this, do this, live like this, do this, da 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 da. And then you got one competing on the other side saying, no, nah, you got to listen to him. Do this, do this, do this, do this. And a little bit later in Second Corinthians, Paul's going to say this is a worldly wisdom and not a heavenly wisdom. Okay? And there's a difference between the two. And I'm going to show you a little bit later tonight. But this person is unstable. They're double minded, not in some of their ways. But what does the word of God say? It means everything. If your mind, if you're double minded, everything you touch creates instability. OK, I wish I had time to elaborate, but it's not really the point. I really wanted to show us the profit or the benefit from going or being in these troubles, uh, being in these in troubles and, and sufferings and trials and tribulations. Amen. All right, let's go back to 2 Corinthians 1. Verse 9, yes, we had this sentence of death, and we looked at that in Acts 14, 19. All right, Paul was stoned, left for dead, and yet the Lord <laughs> blesses him yet again and continue to march on for the cause of Christ. And then he says in verse 10, uh, who delivered us from so a greater death and does deliver us that's collectively in whom we what? That he will also still deliver who? The us's. Right. Who you trust? Who do you trust? And for the church folk, for the us's, it's easy to say the Lord until trouble hits your door. 
Oh, how you doing, sis? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord, quoting scriptures and kisses and hugging. And then next, next couple of weeks, I'm like, man, what's going on, girl? I got some bad news. Why you ain't as, come on now. God was the same then as he is right now in your trouble. And I think that's where we get, that's where, that's where our wives get crossed. We think God's different. Now, now he hasn't changed. All right. He's the same. What does the Bible say? Hebrews 13 and 8. Come on. Somebody know their Bible. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. God does not change. Somebody ought to say amen. My goodness. And it's good to know that even in our instability, he's always stable. It's beautiful. Get this. He says in verse 11, you also helping together in what? Okay. No greater help. Than to be than to send up faithful petition for the believer. I would rather have the prayers of the righteous than money in my hand. Amen. And I'm going to tell you that that was not always true in my life. I'm going to be honest. I'm, I'm going to be. That's me. You hang around me long enough. I'm going to tell you the truth. That was not always me. But I would rather now at this point in my life, I would rather have the prayers of a righteous man or one man than for you to give me anything material that's going to burn up and be passed to somebody else when I'm dead anyway. And look at the word. So in trouble, it's time to do what? Before trouble, we should still be. Most of us don't pray until we get in trouble. And then we want to talk to God when we're in trouble. I'm trying not to preach. Help me, Holy Spirit. We only talk to Jesus when we get in trouble. We talk to Jesus when we receive bad news. But why are we still not having that same relationship and that same perpetuous dialogue before trouble hits our door? Amen. Come on. That's how you get to know his voice. Oh, come on. Come on. We can't we can't be that type of people. And God yet still in his mercy and his love and his grace will still respond to us. Ah, all right. It's good. Comments or questions before we pick up in verse 12, because verse 12, we're going we're gonna to say a lot. I, I got Go ahead. First one, um, off of what you just said, trust in the Lord with all your heart, you know, on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight, not he will straighten your path back out. I like it. And then the other one, just to go a little bit deeper, for, for Paul, that through everything that they're going through, up to the fear of death, he understands that, as you always say, that we have no power, no doomness to, to save ourselves. Right. Our sentence without that justification is death. Amen. To hold that true understanding, no matter what comes in this life, that reliance needs to be on Christ because we have no true power. Hey, I love it. Amen. Anybody else? All right, let's continue. Uh, verse 12, get this. And I want you to go ahead and highlight this scripture in its entirety. All right. And this is one that I have etched. I have deliberately etched in my heart. In fact, the first time I read this, I think it was in 2009 or 2010 when I first read this. And this is still been highlighted in my Bible when I first received this same Bible when I got saved it's still been in my heart and I'm hoping you'll allow the Holy Spirit to etch it in yours listen what Paul says for our boasting is in this that the testimony of our conscience that we can listen to this that we conducted ourselves where with two things what are they simplicity and godly sincerity that's my prayer. My private time, I'm praying 2 Corinthians 1.12. I challenge you to do the same. Am I, in, am I living in this world putting off simplicity? I love it. Simplicity and do I let off or put off a godly sincerity in all that I do? Okay. Am I godly sincere with how I talk to you, how I communicate with you, how I love you, how we interact with one another? Am I godly sincere with my wife? Am I godly sincere with my children? Am I godly sincere with the leadership in this church? Am I godly sincere even when I'm not around the saints? 
when I'm in Publix searching down that good old chicken that I love that I'm going to always talk about and somebody runs into me, am I still godly, sincere and simplistic in who I am in God? This is so important. So important. And why do you think we need to be simplicity and godly sincere? And the answer is actually in the beginning of the verse, because who are we dealing with? The world. Which is which has a tendency to be what? The opposite of these two things. <laughs> Extremely complicated and confusing. Hang out in the world and start ministering and witnessing and evangelizing to the world, which Paul says in, in, in the text that we weren't worse. So let's not forget where we come from. Okay, because truly the only thing that separates us from them is we, we possess the Holy Spirit and they do not. There you go. Say that again. Yeah, there's a peculiarness that should, that, that should even attract even the world. Yeah. Environments, all people, all everything. It's 20, about character and integrity. 25 8. 25 8. That's why it's important that uh, we, that's why Jesus said that we have to be the light of the world. We have to be. The light and the what? The salt. 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 The salt. That's right here. Yeah, the salt. The, the light and the salt of the world. We attract those that are lost into the, uh, into the kingdom. I love it. All right. So ask yourself, don't don't say this out loud. This is between you and the Lord. But am I simplistic to the world? Am I godly sincere to the world? Listen to the rest of the verse. Not with what? But the what? Hey, there's a difference. There's a difference. Not with fleshly wisdom. Underline that. But by the grace of God and more abundantly towards you. Let's go to James chapter three. Because I'm going to show you that there's a difference between these wisdoms. Do, 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 Top of the hour. I love it. Back in James. James chapter three. Let's begin. Let's go 13 to 18. All right. Still hear some pages turning. James chapter three. Talking about wisdom, the same wisdom that Paul reverts to or dialogues about in verse 12. Listen to the word of God. The question is asked, who is wise understanding among you? Let him show by what? Okay, good. Con right. You're right. So that word is the same conduct that Peter talks about when he tells the wives to win their husbands, not with their mouth, but to win them with a lifestyle. Wish I had time. All right, give me I got, I got you did. Uh -uh, so I got to go. Give me 30 seconds. So 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 I, I've had to minister to women who, uh, you know, who are saved and feel, but always beat their husbands down because the husbands don't go to church. Husbands don't read the Bible. Husbands don't take get up on Sunday morning and take the, the, the family to church. And should a man be doing those? Absolutely. But the woman who's saved and feel. And first time I had this conversation, my wife and I with another wife and another husband, she didn't talk to us for like six months and it was all good. But I pointed her to the word and I showed her that you don't beat your husband down because he's not doing what God's called him to do. But you live such a lifestyle that it attracts him to holiness. Right. That's right. Because my testimony is, is that my wife went to Christ and took the children to church and I was at home pornography in and Super Bowl or watching football. We wanted nothing to do with Jesus. I understood that it was something different about her that attracted me. And I wanted to know who she has been in contact with because this is not the woman I married. And I went to church on the resurrection Sunday in 09. And that same Jesus she fell in love with, I fell in love with. And the rest is history. Amen. Do what the Bible says. Don't win them by putting your mouth on them. But Paul and James say, and Peter, you win them by lifestyle. You win them by your conduct. Amen. Come on. Come on. Your conduct. Yes. Watch this. Conduct that his works are done what? In the humility or the meekness of wisdom. 
Yeah. I, I, I never see in the scripture where Christ, the most Christians that are powerful, the most mouthy and the most boastful and the most. No, 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 no. The most powerful people in the scripture are some of the most humble people in the scripture. Even some of the people that I know right now, and I, can, I know them on, on one hand, who are really, really holy people, they are very humble people and very meek people. And they, you don't even know they exist until God calls them to do a thing in, his, in Jesus' name. Now watch this, we're not done. Verse, verse 14, but if you have what? Two things, what are they? And self-seeking in where? Okay, that old heart. That's, that's, that's desperately wicked and deceitful, Jeremiah says. All right, Jeremiah 17, 9 to be exact. That old heart, that if, if these two things exist, do not boast and lie against the truth. Okay? This wisdom, watch the Bible, this wisdom does not descend from above, but is what? Earthly, Earthly sensual, and demonic. Okay. There is a wisdom that is opposite of godly wisdom, and it is demonic wisdom. Is that divination? To an yeah, that's a combination of it, yes. Mm hmm. But I want to show you the scripture tonight so that when something comes out of you that you think's wise, you better hold it up against God's word. Oh, I'm wise and the Lord said, OK. That's again, what James is saying it right. The truth. <laughs> don't 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 boast in a lie against the truth. Then it says for wherever. These two things, envy and self-seeking, exist. What is in company with it? And, and what? Okay. So where you find these two things, self-seeking and evil stuff, is somewhere very close in proximity. Now watch this. Here's the opposite. But, verse 17... The wisdom that's from above is first what? Pure. We go back to the characteristics. Remember Galatians 6? The what? How did John, how did John describe Jesus in John 1? The Lamb of God. And what did we say the three biblical characteristics of the Lamb were? Pure, humble, and sacrificial. Isn't it a coinkadink that we're talking about all these three things tonight? And we're in a totally different book. Okay, the Lamb of God is pure. The wisdom of God is also what? We just read in verse 17, James 3. Pure. There's, no, there's not a mismatch here. They're one and the same. All right? But the wisdom that's from above is first pure, and then it's what? Come on. It's the same. It's the Y'all ain't getting excited. Okay, I'm not, okay, all right, it's just me. It's cool, it's cool. And it's gentle, and it's willing to do what? <laughs> Don, I'm trying. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, it's, it's sacrificial. <laughs> That's what we read in, in James. What's that, um, what's that stand for again? What, what is self-seeking? All about you. Doing something with an ulterior motive. When outwardly you're saying this is a thing of God, but internally within your heart, this is just about you. The only reason you doing a thing and putting the, the stamp of approval of Jesus name is to appease people. But deep inside, God knows the motive and the intention, which according to the word of God will be judged. Okay, basically, basically. So now we're dealing with the wisdom that from above that's first pure, it's peaceable, it's gentle, it's willing to yield, it's full of what? And good fruits. Wish I had time. 
Yeah, and your harvest never lies. And it's without what? what? Partiality and without what? Yeah. Okay, this is a tough one for the assembly of God. And I'm not talking about a, a denomination. I'm talking about the ecclesia, the assembly, the church, the governing body. To do it without hypocrisy. This is wisdom. This is godly wisdom. And then verse 18. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who do what? Make peace. Make peace. Again, going back to that comment from Sister Marie and what I closed out with, I think last week is that it, or week, two weeks before is that your harvest does not lie. What you sow will, will come to will come to harvest. It will come to life. This is important. And there is a difference. Well, well, I'm kind of in between. Well, it, it, no, it's either this or it's either that. It's either demonic wisdom or godly wisdom. There's not a three, a four, a five, a six, a seven, a eight or a nine. No, it's one or the other. It's either demonic wisdom or godly wisdom. Ding, 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 ding. Right. It doesn't exist. The wisdom that comes from you is one of two ways of wisdom. Which one are yours? Don't answer that. Back to 2 Corinthians 12. <laughs> All right. I'll read it one more time. Verse 12. 2 Corinthians. Chapter one, verse 12, for our boasting is this, that the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity, in godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom or demonic or sensual or earthly, but by the grace of God and more abundantly, excuse me, toward you. Verse 13, for we are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand. Now, I trust you will understand even to the end, as also you have understood us in part, that we are your boast as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. Somebody uh, surmise verses 13 and 14, please. What's going on here? You're right. Remember what we just read in James talked and we ended with don't do it with hypocrisy. Remember what we said when we laid the foundation a week or two ago with Second Corinthians is that the Apostle Paul is having he's he's gone past defending the gospel like he did in First Corinthians and even in Galatians. And now he's having to defend his apostolic authority because the Apostle Paul is being accused of being accused of being a hypocrite writing one thing in his letter and then living something totally different outwardly. And that's not what's going. That, that's not what he's doing. All right. So he's saying here that our boast, just like ours, is that the Lord is coming to rescue all of us. That the only reason me and Barnabas and we see that like, or I'm going on these missionary journeys is because I'm committed to Christ. I don't have any personal gain like I, I like. I'm a pretty smart guy. I'm pretty intelligent. I'm, 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 I've got a lot of earthly wisdom. Right? I hung with, under Gamaliel, I, you know, the Sanhedrin, the folks of the Sanhedrin. Like, I'm educated. Like, I've got connects. Like, this ain't about me. Right? This, this is for the glory of Jesus Christ for your benefit. Think about it. I almost died. <laughs> I almost lost my life. Right? Go ahead. He's also talking about that. Yes. Them before when he showed them what they have, they have seen, he's only taught them what they have and what they understand. Right. And then the second part, this is kind of where uh, persecution is starting to ramp up. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, and it's interesting, he talks about don't boast in yourself, but boast in your brothers and the stuff that they do. If you ever go back and look at the martyrs, right? We're, we're in a lineage of people who like go go read some of the early martyrs. You'll you'll realize how ridiculously strong faith can be and what it can do and that we get to boast that our God delivers us from that. It's Amen. Just, it's an amazing thing so they kind of bounce off each other. It is. And if I can, you know what you've got to say, it says I'm going to boast for you, you're going to boast for me because we are made to encourage each other. Yeah, right. Each other so that we grow. Right. 
Right. Right. Right. Like we celebrate each other's victories. Chapman, man, Chapman, Chapman got a new farm or horse. Right. And then we and then immaturity and jealousy goes. But he already got a farm. He already got six horses. But he's also a man who labors in the Lord, who honors his wife, who respects his children, who walks in the counsel of God and the godly. So why you why, why can't we celebrate in him getting another horse? If God gives him 60 more horses, we celebrate. Probably a terrible example, but my point is, is we need to celebrate. And Christians, we got a bad habit, and I'm telling you, some of us, and, and this may be prophetic, and they need to stay off social media for a season, because in your post and in your likes and your share, it shows who you gear and more towards and who, and who you're not. But if we all are of one body, of one mind, of one Christ, we should celebrate in everybody's victories. All right. I love and it. Because we've been created unique and purposeful, it's going to look different. Yeah, and sure. If I question that, then I'm questioning his authority and his sovereignty. That's right. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Right. Celebrate each other, y'all. Verse uh, 15, and in this confidence, I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit. What's he saying? Yeah. Y'all remember that that first that first letter? Right. There were two there were two letters. First Corinthians and second Corinthians. He says in this confidence, I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit to pass by way of you to Macedonia to come again from Macedonia to you. Be helped by you on my way to Judea. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh that with me there should be yes, yes and no, no. What's Paul saying here? It does. Mm hmm. Right. He's not. He's not going to. And, and, and we're going to see a little bit later if we can get to it. But. Paul is saying the reason that some of y'all are still, excuse my, my French, are still jacked up is because you didn't take heed to the first set of instructions when I came and visited you the first time. And it's brought sickness and it's brought death. If you go back to 1 Corinthians, I'm not going to harbor here tonight, but I challenge you to go back to 1 Corinthians 11 and, and start right around the institution of the Lord's Supper, which is actually 24 through 30. Let's go 24 to 30. And you go back and read, not the, not the before, which is talking about head coverings, but when Paul, the Apostle Paul, starts to deliver the institution of the Lord's Supper, remember what he says. He says it talks about the flesh and eating of the bread and the drinking of the blood. And remember, he says that if you do this or take of this cup in damnation, you show the Lord's death till he comes. For this cause or for this reason, many are sick and many sleep among you. You didn't take my heed the first time the Holy Spirit sent me your way. And you wonder why some of y'all are sick. God, I wish I had time. And some of y'all died. You didn't take the warning that the Lord told me to give you. And you brushed it off when you should have listened. And disobedience and folly and sin can also, and it's biblical, can bring, around, can bring about sickness and death. Oh, my God. I'm going to leave it alone. Let's, let's, let's go back. Integrity, meaning not changing my mind, saying what, I'm, saying what I said because I'm saying it with God's authority. Verse 17, therefore, when I was plant, oh, I'm sorry, da, 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 verse 18, but as God is faithful, God is what? Faithful. Underline that. Okay. But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. Okay, so he's saying that my faithfulness is patterned after God. You see that? Because God is faithful, Paul has said, it's forced me to be faithful. I hope that's the same attitude with us. Because Christ is the ultimate example. Then he says, watch this, verse 19, for the Son of God, who is Jesus Christ, who was preached among you, you by us and by me. Sylvanus and Timothy was not yes and no, but in him was yes. So he's saying, listen, 
Not only is, are my yeses yes, and I'm not sitting in the fence, and I'm not walking in gray area, I'm not dropping godly wisdom on one end and then going to a different group through Sylvanius and, and, and another brother and saying, man, here's some earthly, sensual, demonic wisdom. He said, no, we're giving it to you raw and uncut from the heart and the mouth and the mind of God. Amen? Amen. There's, no, there's, no, there's no flip-flop. There's no flim-flam going on. Then he says in verse 20, for all the promises of God in him are what? Yes. And in him are what? Amen. To the glory of who? God, Through who? The us's. That's good news. Okay. You probably heard that in the song. The promises of the Lord are yes and amen. Maybe not. All right. It's beautiful. Verse 21. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is who? Again, he is defending his apostolic authority. I'm anointed because of God. I didn't ask for this. I was I was persecuting the church. I was a terrorist. Christ met me on the road. Go back and read Acts according to the book of uh, according to the apostles, chapter nine. It was Christ who met me. It was Christ who saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. Now, yeah. well, yeah. Stop, Marie. <laughs> now, he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. But not only has he anointed us, but he has also done what? Sealed. Come on. He's done what? Sealed. Us and given us the what? Sealed. Where? Sealed. As a what? Sealed. As a doggone promise. You can take that one to the bank. Amen. Let's go to Ephesians 1.13. Somebody read that when you get it. This is a this is another and I could do this all night, but this is more proof that Paul doesn't say one thing in one letter to a different group of people and then speak something totally different to another group in a different region. What's going on here? In him you also trusted after you heard the, the gospel of, of salvation, truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Thank you, sir. Sealed with the person of the Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed. 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 Like FedEx, USPS, licked it. I don't know if we're still doing that now. They got the little thing that you can pull off and, right? Sealed. Sealed. Can't, can't come out. Sealed. Okay, back to 2 Corinthians. Not only anointed us, but has sealed us. And then giving us the spirit with the capital S in our hearts, which is a guarantee. Moreover, Paul says, I call God as a witness against my what? My psyche. We're going to see that in a couple Sundays from now. In my psyche, my mind, not my brain, but my mind. Because there's actually a difference between the brain and the mind. If something happens to your brain, we go see a neurologist. If something happens to your mind, you go see a psychologist. God, I feel like preaching tonight, but I'm not going to do it. There's a difference between the brain and the mind, and it is the soul of a psyche of a man or woman, the Bible says, with which we serve the Lord with. That's why Paul says, it is my witness unto God that I render nothing else, not my body, not my spirit, but I, I render and witness my soul, my psyche, my mind, because the mind is the instrument that I use to serve the Lord with day in and day out. Amen. This is so powerful. The psyche of a man. And it even starts even in a young man like that. He has a psyche. That little, that little guy right here has a psyche, has a soul. And, he, and Paul says, listen, I, it belongs to the Lord. He says, I came no more to Corinth. He said, I, I, listen, that to spare you, I, I did not come to Corinth anymore. Verse 24, not that we would have dominion over your faith, but that we would do what? That we would do the root of this. That we would do what? Serve. Okay, I didn't, I didn't, it, I'm not, I didn't come to, I didn't take up some massive offering. I didn't ask you to donate to me and Sylvanius and to Timothy. I didn't do any of that. I came there as an apostle of Christ and I rolled up my sleeves and got in the trenches with you. That's what he's saying. 
And he says, not that we can have dominion over your faith, but that we are fellow workers for what? For your joy and for your what? For your faith. What's Paul saying here in closing? Okay. So Paul is saying, I, I didn't, I was not called in sin of God to Lord over you. That's what Jesus does. I only came to encourage and to inspire and to motivate you and to love you and to show you that we're in this thing together. And it's a beautiful attitude to have. It's not about me, Paul says, nor the brothers that God sent with me. But we came to roll our sleeves up with you by faith to show you that we are willing to do whatever we have to do for the sake of your souls and for the cause of Christ.